Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, the event today was supposed to begin from two, and we, I guess, uh, bang on target. So, <clears throat> uh, Institute of Language Studies and Research, ILSR Kolkata, is uh, delighted to uh, have all of you today uh, for the occasional distinguished invited uh, lecture, uh, which is going to be uh, delivered today by Dr. Frederick Schuer. Uh, apologies, Frederick, for the pronunciation. Uh, and uh, the subject for the talk today is uh, environment and emotions. As you can see, uh, there is a subtitle, which is Human Environment Relations between uh, Colonial Scholarship and South Asian Buddhist Reformers in Colonial South Asia. Uh, we'll be uh, having details about the speaker and other formalities, but before I do that, I request uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. Frederick Schwer, and uh, Dr. Shanti Kuhu, Director of Institute of Language Studies and Research, to take the seat there. Thank you. And uh, requesting all the distinguished uh, members of the audience to keep their mobile phones in the silent mode if possible, because that will help in the academic event to go smoothly. Uh, just for the information of everyone, we have washrooms just outside this door. Uh, you have the corridor here. At the end, you have the washrooms. That's for your uh, convenience. And uh, so, uh, I request now uh, Dr. Shanti Guho, uh, the Director of uh, Institute of Language Studies and Research, Kolkata, to deliver the welcome address. Yeah. Good afternoon and namaskar to everyone. On behalf of Institute of Language Studies and Research, ILSR Kolkata, we extend our warm greetings to you all and profusely thanks to you for coming here today to attend this distinguished invited talk on environment and emotions, human environment relations between colonial scholarship and South Asian Buddhist reformers in colonial South Asia, delivered by Dr. Frederick Schwer. Again, <laughs> it's, it's not right, I know. The researcher, Center for History of Emotions, Max Planck Institute of Human Development, Berlin. ILSR Kolkata welcomes Dr. Frederick Schwer the distinguished speaker for today and we also welcome all the distinguished members of the audience. Institute of Language Studies and Research, RLSR Kolkata, established by the Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal, is a premier center for excellence, disseminating advanced knowledge in language, linguistics, lingu language and linguistic studies, translation and cultural research, while pursuing the highest global academic standards, this institute envisions itself as a facilitator of advanced research and employment by leveraging various opportunities offered by the emerging global knowledge and commun communication economy and cultural research. We at ILSR, especially the School of Trans translation and cultural studies are currently engaged with our research on cultural history involving environmental issues and cultures of preservations. We therefore are very happy and happy that Honorable Minister in Charge, Department of Higher Education and Chairman ILSR is always with us to inspire us and encourage us to arrange this invited talk by Dr. Frederick Schroer on environment and emotions, human develop, human environment relations between colonial scholarship and South Asian Buddhist reformers in colonial South Asia. The topic 
is part of Dr. Schroer's current ongoing research project and this subject and, and, we, and we would love to learn from his expertise on this domain. ILSO is committed to promote the highest standards of research in different domains of language, linguistics and cultural studies and we are confident that this distinguished invited talk today will strengthen our institutional mission for cultural research and we are hopeful that today's talk will help immensely in building our research environment and research excellence. Thank you and we once again welcome you all in today's academic event. Now I request Professor Anindo Shikhar Kurokaistho, Professor, School of Translation and Cultural Studies, ILSR, to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Frederick Schwer. Please, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for the welcome note. Um, before I go into the details for the, of the speaker for today's talk, I request uh, our colleague uh, Sri Sripati to do assistant professor in the School of uh, Language Studies, ILSR, to formally greet and felicitate uh, the speaker, Dr. Frederick Shah. Uh, now uh, to the basics, uh, Dr. Frederick Schra, the speaker today, works as a researcher at the Center for the History of Emotions, uh, Max Planck Institute for Human Development Building. Uh, his research uh, focus include the transnational history of Buddhism in the 19th and uh, 20th centuries, the history of emotions, environmental history, and historical semantics. Uh, these and other interests come together in his current research project, Environment and Emotions, Human Environment Relations Between Colonial Scholarship and South Asian Buddhist Reformers in Colonial South Asia. With degrees in Tibetan and Buddhist studies from University of Vienna, as well as Global History from Free University Berlin, Dr. Schroer completed his PhD in Global History at the Free University Berlin in 2020. He further explored the relation between emotions and aesthetics in an international research group of scholars of Buddhism, which culminated in the double special issue, the aesthetics and emotions of religious belonging, examples from the Buddhist world, uh, published in 2021. Uh, we are all uh, delighted to invite Frederick for today's talk. In fact, uh, we are also grateful to Professor Shashwati Mutsuti, Professor in the Department of Pali Catholic University, for introducing uh, Frederick uh, to all of us. Um, we are grateful to you for that. And uh, since then, the research conversation between Frederick and all of us at ILSR have been continuing. In fact, we visited uh, the Mahabodhi Society uh, days back and looked into uh, the archival uh, materials there and had a long discussion about uh, the, you know, as Frederick says, quote-unquote, reservoirs of uh, a knowledge system that are available to cope with the current crisis of the Anthropocene or what people call the capitalism when we have the ecological crisis happening around. It's not just the problem with the ecosystem as we all know, it is also something to do with our emotional ecosystem, our ontological crisis that we are facing. It's not limited to the you know governmental measures that we can take to to thwart and to prevent the uh, crisis deepening within the environment all around. It also necessitates uh, serious thinking about our emotional response to the crisis and the precarious. A situation that we are facing today. So Frederick uh, will be talking about all of this. Um, scholars have been talking about the Anthropocene for decades now. 
but unfortunately, most of these talks have been Eurocentric to a certain extent. And we are happy to know that Frederick came all the way from Germany um, and conducted his research in Kolkata and Bodhgaya. He's also moving to Sarnam, I know, next week, uh, to do further research on Buddhist studies. And um, what is interesting about uh, Frederick's research is that he's looking into the vernacular cosmologies or indigenous models of knowledge systems which are available in a non Eurocentric uh, platforms and, and context which is uh, what makes it very interesting from our positions in the global south. And we, as Dr. Guru said, that we at the School of Translation and Cultural Studies, and not just at the School of Translation and Cultural Studies, we have three schools there at ISR, School of Languages, School of Linguistic Studies, and School of Translation and Cultural Studies. All of us are combined together. We continue the conversation on cultural history, religious history, and how we can build uh, a knowledge system, the uh, vernacular epistemic uh, system to cope with the current crisis, which have been talking for centuries about convivial living, you know, connected living. I remember in this context, and I, I guess Freddie will be talking more about it, Donna Haraway's recent slogan, make keen and not berries in the Anthropocene. Very interesting. So we have to, you know, consolidate this habit of connecting with each other, that dislocation has taken place, dislocation from the planet Earth, dislocation from each other, and that disembedding has resulted in this crisis of the Anthropocene. So I, I guess that uh, Frederick will be talking more about it and will be uh, enlightened by his words. And without wasting uh, any further time on that, uh, I request everyone once again to keep their mobile in the silent mode and invite Frederick to begin the talk. Over to you, Frederick. <clears throat> is being set up, I'll, I'll get underway. Um, excuse me, my throat is a little sore. Uh, I'm under the weather a tiny little bit, so uh, sorry. But, you know, it might be a bit difficult to understand me at times. Um, my sincere thanks to um, the Institute for Language Studies and Research, to Director Dr. Shwati Guha, but also, as already mentioned, to Professor Saswati Mutsubi, from the Pali Department of Calcutta University, who has been really um, the nexus of connecting all of us. I reached out to uh, the professor when I was still in Germany, and uh, she was very kind to answer immediately and offer any help I might need. And uh, we had a lovely time getting to know each other and her students as well. And she connected um, many of the people who are in the room here, and so I'm profoundly grateful for that. Thank you. Now, what I'm going to talk about um, under this very long and cumbersome title that uh, you know uh, everybody has already been struggling with uh, is very much work in progress, as you've already heard. So this is uh, what's on my desk at the at this moment. Uh, I'm sort of just coming out of the archive uh, in Kolkata. I'm going back into the archive in Sarnath, as Anindya already mentioned. Um, and of course, it never ends with just uh, you know one archival trip. So this is very much all work in progress. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, as um, you've already heard, and the title suggests, I focus on Buddhist on the Buddhist reform movement in the late 19th and early 20th century, and um, the central organization that I work with is the Mahabodhi Society. Hence. I was in their archive here in Kolkata for a couple of weeks, digging my way through their holdings. Um, and I'd like to start with a quote by um, a then rather young man, 26 years old. Could you press? And once more. And so he writes in his diary <clears throat> of the 22nd of January, 1891, he writes, under the shade of the holy Bodhi tree, where I bade farewell to all the pleasures of the world. I forgot everything at that moment when I offered my life to the Lord Buddha. 
And then he continues in his notebook saying that he took an oath joyously and solemnly to reclaim the temple grounds of Bodh Gaya for Buddhists. Now, as you may have perhaps already guessed, the person who is speaking here, who's writing, and whose diary you can see in the back, is the Anagarika Dhammapala, born Don David Heva Vitarne in uh, Sri Lanka, who was the spearhead of the movement that crystallized as the Mahabodhi Society. And he continues, presently, as soon as I touched with my forehead the Vajrasana, that is, the diamond throne underneath the Bodhi tree, a sudden impulse came to my mind. It prompted me to stop here and take care of this sacred spot, so sacred that nothing in the world is equal to this place where Prince Shakya Sinha gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Okay, so uh, I've, I guess, thoroughly established now that this place was very important to the Anagarika Dhammapala, and um, he was very emotional about this. Okay, so let's get this underway. Now, shortly after he penned these lines in January of 1891, Anagarika Dhammapala founded the Mahabodhi Society, first in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and on the 31st of May that year, and then moved the Mahabodhi Society to Kolkata in the following year. Next slide, please. When he also started publication of the Journal of the Mahabodhi Society from May 1892 onwards. And this is a photo of uh, what remains of the first issue in the archive of the Mahabodhi Society nowadays. Next one, please. Um, the Mahabodhi Journal changed its name in 1902 uh, to Mahabodhi and the United Buddhist World, showing the thrust of the movement, which was never limited only to Kolkata or only to India, but which always saw itself as connecting far beyond the limits of the Indian subcontinent. And then in um, 1924, next please, um, the journal reverts to the title the Mahabodhi, but its mission of connecting or uniting the Buddhist world very much stays the same. Now this united Buddhist world, or um, this enunciatory act, the aim that they are formulating here, names the networks that I am following in my research. So I'm following my actors, that is the Mahabodhi Society, in terms of who are they talking to, who is important to them, whom are they reaching out to, where are they getting their ideas from. And this means um, transposing my focus geographically, but it also means transpo transposing my focus in time back to um, the thought worlds of where they get their ideas from. Next slide, please. Now, back to this uh, title that, let's see, I might apply for you know, the prize of the world's most cumbersome uh, research project title. But you know, this is how research projects go when you, know, you start them out and you're trying to be very precise and very open at the same time. So take this with a grain of salt. If I break it down more easily, then um, my project focuses on three main coordinates. One of them is the history of Buddhism in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now that's pretty obvious, you know, the actors that I'm drawing on, the thought worlds that I bring in, etc. The second coordinate is environmental history, and not just environmental history, but general ecology. And this is really where um, perhaps the most important element of the subtitle are the relations. So here I'm drawing on work um, that originates with um, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari and has been, uh, has been pursued by a couple of other um, thinkers such as the Austrian philosopher Erich Hörl on general ecology as a framework, meaning, meaning that in this sense ecology doesn't mean that um, we only study green things. The environment is not just the natural environment, but general ecology means that we focus on relationality within all kinds of environments, and I will get back to that. Now, of course, this resonates quite well um, with Buddhism, since Buddhism also posits relations not as second-order phenomena, not as things that result from pristine objects, but as what makes up phenomena. 
and I will touch on this again. And the third coordinate of my research, sorry, by the way, I think they were there, and you can just click three times. <laughs> this is the problem when you don't do your own, um, you don't drive your own PowerPoint presentation. Um, so the third coordinate is um, early Buddhism as a conceptual resource. So what do I mean with that? As I already said, I, um, I'm looking at not just the networks of my actors, but also where did they get their ideas from. And there is a profound um, danger or a profound problem that we are facing, especially in environmental humanities, and Anidia already pointed this out, is that a lot of the research nowadays that we have on environmental humanities or on the history of the Anthropocene is marred by Eurocentrism. So the underlying assumptions that we have about environments and how to quantify them, how to study them, the science that underlies a lot of the Anthropocene scholarship is firmly and fundamentally based in Europe. Now, I'm not doing hard science environmental studies in any case. I don't measure precipitation graphs, uh, soil samples, ice cores, etc. But I'm in the larger orbit of environmental humanities. And in order to assuage, to kind of lessen perhaps the problem of Eurocentrism, I'm trying to bring contemporary discourses in, such as the critiques of the Anthropocene, and you already mentioned, Donna Haraway's critique, we could add a lot more, Jason Moore comes to mind, Catherine Dusoff comes to mind, and other strands in contemporary thinking, such as posthumanism, new materialism, with precisely the kinds of intellectual um, contents that these guys of the Mahabodhi Society were going back to. And they were really passionate about their Pali text. It's pretty plain and simple. In every issue of the Mahabodhi Journal, um, Anagarika Dharmapala and others published texts on Pali literature. They published translations. Sometimes they published Pali originals. And so these were important coordinates to their thought world. Of course, it didn't end there. And of course, colonial India wasn't you know, a space that can be limited to only one vernacular or only one classical philosophy. But I believe that it is product productive to tap into these, um, into, these, into these reservoirs of thought in order to see what we can do with concepts beyond the rim of the Eurocentric thought world. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, um, as is probably clear by um, my affiliation with the Center for the History of Emotions at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development Berlin, and by the recurring uh, concept of emotions, um, emotions are key to my project. But what do I mean by that? Now, I don't stand here as a psychologist. I stand here mainly wearing the hat of a historian, also wearing the hat of a Buddhist studies scholar, None of that connects me to psychology. So when I say that my um, focus is on the emotions, I don't mean that I'm trying to study how people felt in the 19th century, because we will never know, frankly speaking. They are past, that time is gone. We can't put them into an fMRI scanner and see what areas in their brain light up you know, when we poke them this way or that way. Some of the colleagues in the other departments at our institute do just that, and they do fantastic research with that, and very groundbreaking so. But as a historian, I have to rely on other tools. This means that I also have other opportunities. So when I say that I study emotions, I study emotions, one, for what they are. What kind of emotions do we find in the sources that we have? What uh, sort of emotional concepts or practices do our actors draw on in order to make sense of their life worlds? But then, as a historian, we make emotions the object of our historicization. Next, please. And this means that, firstly, emotions have a history. So that means that they change over time. Obviously, the way that, say, Rasa Shingara is conceived of in the Natya Shastra mm -hmm. is not quite the same that love operates in contemporary India. And this holds true for all emotions. Emotions are relative to their historical context and to their geographical context. 
So we unearth the cultural history of emotions in order to unearth or to embed our actors in their cultural history. And the second premise of the history of emotions is that emotions make history. What does that mean? It means that emotions are not, again, second order phenomena. They are not sort of epiphenomena. It's not the, the fact that someone acts and then feels good or bad about what they did. But the underlying assumption is that we have to understand emotions in order to understand how our actors make their decisions. What drives them to do what they did? What drove them to come together, to go apart, to um, you know, protest on the streets, etc., etc. That, in a nutshell, is my approach to the history of emotions. Now, as I already mentioned, um, what I've been talking about now mainly relies on uh, unfinished parts of my research project and directly feeds off the research that I've been doing in Kolkata archives up to this point, the Mahabodhi Society, also, for example, the State of West Bengal archives. But it also means that I'm immersing myself at least a little, sort of dipping my pinky um, into Kolkata as a mental space. And this occasion here, us being in this room together, is of course part of that as well. So I'm thankful for all of you being here today and sharing this with me. Next, please. Now, Dharmapala, as I already mentioned, was embedded in a complex set of relations and networks. We have Dharmapala here in the middle, then we have, click, click, <laughs> the two infamous theosophists, Helena Petrova Blavatsky and Henry Steele Olcott, who are very instrumental, who were very instrumental in the 1880s and early 1890s in sponsoring Dharmapala's efforts, allowing Dharmapala to travel on their funds, and really making it possible for them to rediscover Gaya as you saw in the diary above. It also includes, next, other people that he met. And here you see a snap that was taken in 1893 at the Chicago World Parliament of Religions. Now, a very immediate result of the Mahabodhi Society beginning publishing of the Mahabodhi Journal was that they got invited to the World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. And you can see here Dhammapala standing next to Vicham Gandhi on the left, who was a representative of Jainism at the parliament. Um, then, of course, it's Dharmapala is the next from the left. Next is obviously Swami Vivekananda, who was a representative of Hinduism. And um, the last person in the front row is actually a French guy um, by the name of Bonne Mori, who was a representative of French Protestantism. But the networks also include, next, next, people such as Alexander Cunningham and Rajendra Mitro, colonial archaeologists who, as I will explain in a little short while, were instrumental in putting Bodhgaya back on the map and um, forming the narrative that the Mahabodhi Society then later could tap into. And two more clicks, please. And finally, it also included Orientalist scholars, such as T.W. Lewis Davids or Vian Barua, who you see on the right, who were not only instrumental in putting Pali um, texts back on the map in an international um, perspective, but who were also directly affiliated with the Mahabodhi Society and kept publishing articles in their journal. So we could play this for a long time, and I could be putting up more and more pictures, but it gets tiring after a certain while. So. Um, I think I'll move on. So what do I mean um, when I say between colonial scholarship and South Asian Buddhist reformers? It means that I'm um, sort of putting a diachronic perspective to the, these networks and uh, looking at the different vectors across which ideas and people traveled in that time. It means that I'm trying to follow my actors, as I already said, in seeing what was important to them. and what was important as their prehistory in terms of making possible the emergence of this movement. Next slide, please. Now, finally, I'm getting to a more concrete example. And the example is, um, excuse me, a particularly green thing. It's a, a tree. 
But as I hope to show, um, it's a good example of how the purported natural is never limited to the purported natural. So in the May issue of 1893, that is in the first issue of its second volume of publication, the Mahabodhi uh, Journal published a mission statement of the society. And the mission statement read, the Mahabodhi Society, which was organized on May 31st, 1891, has a great work to accomplish, to make known to all nations the sublime teachings of the Arya Dharma of the Buddha Shakyamuni, and to rescue, restore, and re-establish the holy place, Buddha Gaya, where stands the Bodhi tree. Um, sorry. This was still on the last slide. And the quote continues. Um, could you go back one slide? Yeah. Yes. And the quote continues on the Bodhi tree and says, never to fade and ever to be kept, the Bodhi tree, in homage of the world beneath whose leaves it was ordained, the truth should come to wood. Now, this is the direct quotation, or at least a more or less direct quotation. And where does it come from? Next slide. It comes from Edwin Arnold's The Light of Asia, which was published in 1879. Next. And in Arnold's words, the quote runs thus. The Bodhi tree thence forward in all years, never to fade and ever to be kept in homage of the world, beneath whose leaves it was ordained that truth should come to the wood. Which now the master knew, wherefore he went, with measured pace, steadfast, majestical, unto the tree of wisdom, O oh, ye worlds, rejoice, our world wended unto the tree. The Mahabodhi Society kept quoting this particular quote of um, Edwin Arnold's in its mission statement over and over again, establishing the trope of the Bodhi tree and of the link between the tree and the temple. And in fact, Dharmapala had gotten the idea of saving Bodhgaya as he himself later stated, only after reading Edwin Arnold's later book, published in um, 1886, called India Revisited, in which Arnold describes at length the current state of Budgaya, the sorry state of Budgaya, one would have to say. And as a fun fact, Dhammapala read this book, uh, not in Sri Lanka, but actually in Japan in 1889, where he had traveled together with Colonel Olcott in order to translate for Theravada monks with whom Olcott was traveling to Japan. So it's rather interesting to see the circuitous route uh, that Dhammapala followed, in which he had to travel to Japan first in order to come to Budgaya later, which of course geographically is far closer. Next slide. Sorry, you can't really um, see this. Click again. So in um, May 1892, um, on the work of the uh, Mahabodhi Society, there was another article in the Mahabodhi Journal, in the very first issue of the Mahabodhi Journal, titled The Sweet Spirit of Buddhism. And it was quite explicit in the depth that the Mahabodhi Society saw itself as standing in by saying in the sort of in a circle passage there, the two chief reviving agencies for spreading Buddhism, the two channels through which it is flowing are a book and a society, the light of Asia and the Theosophical Society. So we see that the Mahabodhi Society, at least in its early years, until it split, uh, until Dhammapala and Olcott had a falling out over the, over the tooth relic in Kandy in the early 1900s, the Mahabodhi Society saw itself as very closely entangled with the Theosophical Society and actually depending on the Theosophical Society, both for material support and for alerting itself to the importance of its mission. Now, Arnold himself, the book that Dhammapala quotes, The Light of Asia, of course, uh, didn't come up with all of this on his own either. And so there is a long prehistory to this as well. And I'd like to take you through this rather quickly. Next slide, please. And so one of the earliest descriptions that we can find of the temple, next, is Ian, uh, is Francis Buchanan's, later Francis Hamilton's, uh, journal that he kept during the survey of the districts of Patna and Gaia in 1811 to 12, in which he described the site as 
two principal objects of worship, that is, a peepal tree placed on the west side of a terrace forming the lower part of a mandir, spire or pyramid, containing the image of Mahamuni. So already in the very early 19th century, we see established tree and temple as a pair that always appear together and work together. Now Hamilton or Bakalan is a bit unclear as to whether the tree is actually on the west side or the east side of the temple, but he does describe the status of the tree in which he found him in the very early 19th century. And he says, it's a fine tree in full vigor and in all prob probability cannot exceed a hundred years in age and has probably sprung from the ruins long after they had been deserted. A similar tree, however, may have existed there when the temple was entire. So the tree that um, Hamilton found was flourishing, but he had doubts over its historicity. Now, um, later in the 1860s, next please, we have descriptions of Alexander Cunningham's visit to the site. And you know, Alexander Cunningham became the first um, archaeological surveyor to the government of India in the same year, in 1861, when he did his first um, extensive survey of the site. And Cunningham writes, Buddha Gaya is famous as the locality of the holy pipal tree, under which Shakya Sinha sat for six years in mental abstraction until he attained Buddhahood. And he continues, the celebrated Bodhi tree still exists five, uh, five decades after Hamilton, but is very much decayed. One large stem with three branches to the westward is still green, but the other branches are barkless and rotten. The green branch perhaps belongs to some younger tree, as there are numerous stems of apparently different trees clustered together. The tree must have been renewed frequently, as the present people is standing on a terrace at least 30 feet above the level <coughs> of the surrounding country. So in the 1860s, we find the tree in a rather sorry state, or um, Cunningham not being very appreciative of it. And then a little over a decade later, we have another description by Rajendra Mitro. In his book-length survey, Buddha Gaya, the Hermitage of Shakyamuni, which includes extensive literary quotations and also makes use of the recently translated pilgrim's narrative of Xuanzang, of the Chinese pilgrim who uh, traveled in the 6th century to uh, the Buddhist holy sites in India. And Mitro describes the Bodhi tree is the most sacred object of worship at Buddha Gaya. So perhaps you keep noticing that the tree comes before the temple here, which is quite significant. It was under its friendly shelter that Shakya obtained the perfection of wisdom, and it is therefore looked upon with the highest veneration. And he also has a lot to say on the reinvigoration or the actual state of the tree, and explains that in 1876, the tree was dead and knocked down by a storm, and it, in its place has now been filled by a seedling about three feet high. So Mitra muses that probably someone at the temple keeps dropping new seedlings into the stem of the old tree in order to kind of perpetuate this, um, this uh, never dying tree, which is always growing and always renewing itself. Now, one interesting tidbit of information here is that a lot of these early surveyors didn't know that Bodhi trees are deciduous, meaning that they shed their leaves. So some of these descriptions that say actually that, um, you know, that branches are dead because they don't have any leaves, we have to take with a grain of salt, since in the season when they typically went for serving, the tree would shed its leaves and then later regrow them. <coughs> Next slide, please. So what do we make of all of this? <clears throat> I would argue that in the century running up to the founding of the Mahabodhi Society, we see a certain kind of green language, to use Raymond Williams' a term, is being established on the site of Bodhgaya. Click. I think three times, probably. And we see this kind of green language, once more, continuing in different publications. This is from the 1930s, actually, from a little publication, the Bosat, which I found in the Mahabodhi Society's archives. It's a small, like this, publication published in Sri Lanka. And it keeps using the motif of the Bodhi tree. You can see the typical heart-shaped leaves. You see it down there as um, the cutting of the Bodhi tree that was taken, so legend goes, by Ashoka's daughter uh, to Sri Lanka and where it was planted in Anuradhapura. And so we keep seeing this, um, 
this remarkably uh, green language popping up in uh, periodicals that otherwise are totally logocentric. Otherwise, what's important to these people is Buddhist psychology, is uh, new developments in science, including things like aura photography, etc., which are seen as the cutting edge of science at that time. And yet, a green language keeps creeping in. So what do we make of this? Is this, as Raymond Williams wrote in The Country and the City in the 70s, is this really a nature culture dialectic? Is this a form of Orientalism, to put it simply, in which um, nature is constituted simply as the other of culture? I don't think so, but you might have been anticipating this already. Um, there is certainly Orientalism in this green language, in the sense that if you look at people like Edwin Arnold, the way that they describe, for example, the landscapes in Sri Lanka is fundamentally Orientalist. It's almost like, you know, tea advertisements of the time, kind of conceiving of Sri Lanka as this primordial garden Eden in which, you know, tea plantations flourish and time stands still. More clicks, please. Yeah. One more. And so here we have two more publications from the Mahabodhi Society. This one is from 1950. Devapriya Bali Sinha, who is the successor of uh, Anagarika Dhammapala as the uh, secretary of the Mahabodhi Society, published in 1950 this Guide to Bodhgaya. Now, isn't it interesting that the Guide to Bodhgaya, where you typically go to see the temple, has only the tree on its cover? And then this one, this is long after my time frame from 1968, but it's so interesting that I wanted to show it to you, is a Vaishaka number of the Mahabodhi Journal, which shows, the, again, the pair of the tree and the temple. But, you know, if you've been to Bulgaria, you know that the temple is pretty high. I think it's 88 meters high. And so even if the tree is big, it's never as big as the temple. But on this illustration, the tree towers over the temple by far. And it has far more detail, whereas the temple is only basically this pyramid shape. The tree has roots, it has the individual leaves characteristically painted in. And so what is really of importance in this pairing of tree and temple is the tree. Because this is what you can establish an emotional connection with, since the tree in the stories already had an intimate connection with the founder of the religion, the Buddha. Now, therefore, I think that putting an ecological perspective to this matter means going beyond an ecological perspective as green things. The tree is not just about the tree. The tree operates as an assemblage, as a multitude constituted from more than just the tree, the physical tree itself. It's constituted by the stories of the tree. It's constituted by the people who have relations to the tree. And it's also constituted by the archaeological site and the premises of the temple. This, I would argue, is how the tree gains its agency, by being more, always more, than just a tree. And putting an ecological perspective to this means studying relations, how people relate to the tree and how the tree is constituted of a host of phenomena in relations. Next slide. Now, I'd like to touch on one of the other aspects of my research project, which is the more theoretical part of the project. I think we need to have another kick. Being textual environments. So, this is a, um, I'd like to start with this very, um, quite famous quote from the Satipatthana Sutta, from the Sutta of the Establishment of Mindfulness. Now, the mindfulness, of course, in the present is, has been thoroughly commercialized by Goika International. Um, but mindfulness is also very important in the early Buddhist doctrine. And so the Satipatthana Sutta and its sibling, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, which is slightly longer, um, are important parts of the monastic curriculum. And so very early on in the Sutta, we have this passage that reads, the Buddha is talking, obviously, and how, O monks, does a monk abide as one who observes the body in the body? And then later you observe Vedana, that is affect in Vedana, etc. Et Here, O monks, a monk, 
gone to the forest, or gone to the root of a tree, or gone to an empty house, sits down, having crossed his legs, having set his body upright, having readied his mindfulness as focused. Thus mindful, he breathes in, mindful, he breathes out. So what's happen happening in this canonical passage here? We have a lot of attention to the location of the body, not just in the sense of observing the body in the body, but also in terms of the posture of the body, the actions of the body, the senses of the body. In short, the body, how it relates to an environment. And so the environment here, of course, is important, and we have to be quite specific about what kind of environment we are talking about. Next slide. So in this sentence taken from the quote above, Idha, here, Bidkave, monks, Bhikkhu Aranya Gaktova, Rukka Mura Gaktova, Shunya Gaktova, Nisidati. A monk sits down, having gone to the forest, gone to the root of a tree, gone to an empty house. So, cartographic accuracy. Where has the monk gone? We translate the sentence typically as gone to the forest, but what's written there is not specifically the typical word that we would expect for forest, it's aranya. So there are several, of course, as you know, for anything, there are, we have a plenitude of terms in the Pali and Sanskrit languages, but the two main sort of conceptual reference here would be vana for the forest and aranya for the wilderness. And there is a certain sort of uh, transaction between the two. But if you think of terms such as, in the Buddhist perspective, Jetavana, Venuvana, etc., all of these places where the Buddha taught, these are park-like environments. So we're speaking of a forest, but what we really mean is a very manicured kind of landscape where there might be a deer park, you know, where there is a vihara established, where the grass is cut, etc., etc. Whereas the Aranya doesn't have to be a forest. Shrubland can be Aranya. Grassland can be Aranya. Desert can be Aranya. So this is a very different kind of perspective. So what is the text actually doing here? It's speaking of a certain kind of an ascetic ideal in which the early Buddhist practitioners project onto the wilderness as the ideal setting of contemplative practice. Now recent scholarship, such as by uh, Johann Elverskog, has um, driven home the point that early Buddhism was a fundamentally cosmopolitan religion, meaning that most of these guys were very urban. Early Buddhists depended on cities for donations, their alms, for political and uh, financial patronage, for resources in terms of finding people to teach to, etc., etc. So if in practice early Buddhism was closely aligned to the cities of ancient India, then its ascetic ideal was spelling out the exact opposite. It was talking of going to the remotest of remote places in order to practice there. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you can go through all of these. I forgot to tell you. Now, next quote, and maybe you can do all the points. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't forget. Okay. So, here's another sentence taken from the quote that I showed earlier. And I really like to um, focus here on what the person, what the practitioner is doing. When this big gu is sitting, observing the body in the body. Kaya, kaya, anupassi, anupassin, viharati. So, how is this person constituted? We know, of course, from uh, early Buddhist psychology, that the individual is made of, up of five khandas, that is heaps. So the individual is an agglomeration, just like I made the argument for the tree, the individual in Buddhism, in early Buddhism, is also an assemblage of very different, various different factors, rupa being the material side, and then the remaining four khandas being of the mental constituency. What I find really interesting here is um, the verb, or um, what the monk is doing, he is observing. He is sitting in observation. Anupasati. What does this mean? 
So if we translate this into English languages, as I've done, or other European languages, then we do have a certain kind of inbuilt sense of perception being a one-way road. Is uh, There is some kind of a stimulus, and uh, it reaches my eye, and I see it, and thus I observe it. This is, of course, not necessarily how perception works in South Asia. And if we again look to Buddhist psychology, early Buddhist psychology, then we find with the concept of the ayatanas, of the sense bases, that there is a kind of pairing going on. So there is an inner sense base and an external sense base. So the object that I'm looking at is the external sense base that communicates with the internal sense base of the faculty of seeing that I have as a constituted assemblage. And so, the commentary of literature describes this, or paraphrases this, as a form of touching, pasta, sparsha, or, um, as Buddha Gosha writes, a meeting, coming together, samosarana. So, the external and the internal, in the sense of, in the act of perception, come together in a very visceral, touching, you know, kind of direct kind of way. So I find this very interesting in the sense of how, do, how does the individual relate to the environment and how does the environment in turn relate to the individual? How do the two shape each other? And so as um, earlier scholars of, um, of Theravada psychology have uh, pointed out, such as Sue Hamilton, early Theravada is really concerned with the practicing individual and what goes on in his or less often so her head. And the number one pointer that we have to this is that the word loka, world, most of the time in the Pali Canon appears and doesn't mean the world at large, but the world, how it is perceived by the individual. And so this is taken by some scholars to argue that early Buddhism is sort of uh, negating the world or not really interested in the world at large, much more interested only in the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, which is certainly true, that's the thrust of the teaching. But if we conceive of this kind of concept of loka as a life world, as a sort of, that's the experiential domain in which the individual and their environments co-constitute one another, then early Theravada is fundamentally environmental. It's fundamentally worlded because this actually means that Buddhism doesn't really worry about an, an kind of objective world that is out there, but a world that emerges from the relation, from the sort of touch, pasa, between the individual and their environment. Next page. And so my argument would be that emotions are central in this. We've already seen a couple of emotional concepts coded into the quotes that I gave you. And, um, Recently, Roy Zoha, Maria Haim, and Ramprasad Chakravarti have um, published this fantastic volume on um, emotions in classical Indian philosophy. And they describe emotions in a very different way from the way that we might perceive them or conceive of them in, uh, in say, uh, psychology in the sort of Eurocentric tradition. And they write, emotions appear primarily as perceptual modes. So we have perception again, anupasati of the natural world in particular, thereby creating an emotional space in which the subject and the external world are, phenomenologically speaking, inextricably bound together. So what does that mean? So somehow the emotions glue together the individual and their environment. The problem, of course, is more fundamental, right? Because I keep speaking of individual when talking about early Buddhist philosophy, which doesn't really make sense. Because we, of course, have all of the um, sort of literature that disproves the Putgaya, the, uh, the individual. Um, we have all of the literature against the Atman. And so if I translate, you know, or if I describe the Putgu as an individual, I'm already committing a logical error. Next slide. Now I'd like to point you to a surprising really surprising passage from one uh, minor, less known sutta, which is the Tithayatana Sutta, the discourse of sectarian views, in which uh, for a long time different views of other religious or philosophical traditions of the time are discussed. But there is a really interesting passage in there. 
in which the Buddha speaks and he folds an ontogenic description, that is a description of the embryo developing, into the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And so this description runs shortened like this, from the six elements as the most uh, uh, basic substance, almost, follows the appearance of an embryo. After its descent into the womb, there is name and form. With name and form as condition, there are the six sense bases, the ayatanas that I already mentioned. With the six sense bases as condition, there is contact, pasa. With contact as condition, there is feeling, vedana, affect. Now, indeed, it is for one who is feeling, O monks, that I declare this is suffering, that I declare this is the origin of suffering, that I declare this is the cessation of suffering, that I declare this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. In typical Pali, uh, circuitous formulation. Now, isn't this interesting? The passage is singular. In contrast to a lot of the other passages that I quoted, many of which are pericopes, meaning that they reappear over and over again in different texts throughout the Pali canon, this one doesn't. So, we might say it's not very significant. On the other hand, it's part of the canonical literature. And I'd really like to draw your attention to the present participle here, which is vidyamanasa. For the monk who is currently in the process of feeling. It's for this person that the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths. So, what does he imply there? He's not teaching it to people who are devoid of feelings. Well, it wouldn't make sense because, you know, in terms of the constitution of the individual, everybody has Vedana, hence everybody feels. So it must be something different that the Buddha stresses here. And I would argue the Buddha stresses here the fact of affective entanglement, of being in an emotionally negotiated relation to an environment that enables the Buddhist teaching to make sense. So I think this is what the Buddha is saying, why he is teaching what he does for those who are currently in the process of feeling. And I'd like to give you an example for this. Next slide. So um, again, back to the Mahabodhi Journal. In 1900, November 1900, I uh, happened upon a really interesting short article which you can't really make it out there, but it's on the right-hand side of the, of the right page, and it's an article super titled Spiritual Fearlessness. And uh, the article, which is quite brief, describes the Buddha being in the wilderness, we have the Aranya again, experiencing terrific influences, and somehow coming out in a state of spiritual fearlessness. Now, what is um, this article referring to? It's referring, again, as usual, to a canonical text, Next slide, which is the Bhaya Bhairava Sutta, the Sutra of Fear and Dread. And in this um, sutra, we have a typical kind of early Buddhist teaching situation. A Brahmin comes to the Buddha with a problem. And he you know, describes his problem to the Buddha, and then the Buddha, as is typical for this kind of literature, answers again in this very circuitous kind of way, driving home his point and showing what is the actual, the right way to practice Buddhism. And so what does this Brahmin Janu Soli say? He says, indeed, hard to endure, O Gautama, are dwellings in wild forests. Remote lodgings. Solitude is hard to do. Loneliness is hard to enjoy. The forests, I think, plunder the mind of a monk who is not holding on to concentration. So here, of course, he's already anticipating the solution, it being a monk who is not properly holding on to his concentration. So, again, similarly to the Satipatthana Sutta, we have a very specific kind of location of the body in a very specific kind of environment, in wild forests, sitting in meditation, only this time it doesn't work, right? This time, you don't sit down at the root of a tree, somewhere gone to the wilderness, and everything's you know, fine and dandy, and you really get on with your meditation. No, it doesn't work. And so what does the Buddha answer? Very, you could say laconically, or emphatically, he says, evam itam. Exactly. <laughs> so it is, says the Buddha. It is hard. And then he repeats in long, repetitious passages how it is hard, and how it was hard for him, and why it was hard for him. 
And then we really have a focus on emotions as emotional practices. And we have this surprising, mm, this surprising focus on the vulnerability, on the openness of the body to its environment, in the sense that if you're not right prepared, if, you, you know, if your mind <coughs> is not well prepared, you will lapse. You will lose your mind in the forest. Because all things can, all kinds of things can happen in the forest, and all kinds of things can scare you in the forest. And so, um, next slide. Yeah. And so the Buddha speaks of seeking fear out and waiting for fear. Bhaya pratikanti viharati. So you know, once he's sort of finished with his long list of why someone might not be properly suited to go into the wilderness for, med for meditation, he actually says, okay, so once I, I realized all of this, it occurred to me, let's go right into this fear. And so then he said, I decided to seek out these places at night, go to the forest at night when it's, it, you know, at its most dreadful. Mm -hmm. And I would sit at night and wait for the fear to come and ask myself, is this a fear that's coming? And so then he's describing different uh, sort of things that are happening in the forest. The, the wind is blowing and rustling leaves, and because it's dark, suddenly it's frightening. You know, your hair stands on end. And so again, we have this very physical, very bodily description of what is happening with the individual in the environment. The interesting thing, however, is that the things that the Buddha is describing are not very frightening. So, you know, the wind, okay, you can mistake the wind, you know, maybe. Then a deer comes by, the royal animal par excellence in ancient India. So, okay, the deer, I mean, you know, if it, it, it were a tiger or an elephant perhaps, you know, but it, it's a deer. And then the other animal that, you know, sort of comes and per potentially frightens is a peacock. Um, so, so what's going on here? So again, we have this kind of this junction, this disassociation between the ideal of the Aranya, of the Aranya Vana here, of the wild forest in which all kinds of, you know, not just fearsome things, but terrorsome things can happen. And then actually we are back to the Vana, to the deer park, you know, where peacocks are strolling and the wind is blowing the leaves, and actually it's a rather pastoral scene. So, um, you know. But the interesting thing here is that fear is not avoided, but that fear, the emotion of fear and terror actually, are the path of practice that the Buddha describes in this text. And it's only through these emotions that he's able to um, sort of, as you will, master the situation and come you know, out at the end of fear and expel it, parking it. And so then he closes that in whichever state, walking, standing, lying, etc., etc., uh, this fear, you know, would then emerge. It would not break his stride anymore. He knows the fear. He knows how it's coming. He knows what's happening. What are the physical sort of, uh, you know, aspects of this fear, um, and how to then expel the fear once you have gone through the fear. So, coming back to the way that the Mahabodhi Jhana super titled it, I think this text is not, you know, only on spiritual fearlessness. It's actually on fear as important to spiritual practice. And I think there might be important resonances in texts like these with uh, you know, contemporary debates. Think of eco-anxiety, you know, think of the fear that very real climate uh, change impact has on us today, where it is frightening. It is frightening when you know, your village is swamped, when the coastline erodes, when there is no water anymore, or too much of it, etc., etc. And so what do we do with that fear? <laughs> Do we run away from it? Do we try our best to negate the fear, to push it away, to kind of, uh, uh, you know, cuddle us in some kind of sense of security and dream of these terms like resilience, etc., etc.? But then it catches you, doesn't it? And it also, by by this point, luckily, it also catches people in the global north. Um, and so we have to deal with these emotions. So we have to deal with these emotions such as fear and terror that come up in our relations to our environments. And I think there is perhaps an inspiration here in this reservoir for thought on how to deal with these emotions differently. Next slide, let's see. Um, just click on one. So to sum up, 
what I've been saying is that apart from this cumbersome title, my project is really about relations between humans and the non-human or their environments. It's about the way how humans and non-humans transact. What travels between the human and the other? Emotions, um, encounters, uh, it might be information, material things. And I think emotions act as the media of this relationality. As we've seen in the textual examples, and as we've seen also in the history of the Bodhi tree and how it was leveraged by the Mahabodhi society, we can see how it's through the emotional relation to these objects that are always more than just a simple object, we see how these relations are conducted. But it also speaks of the role of the body, of how in all of these instances we find the human body specifically placed with a surprising amount of cartographic accuracy of where the body is placed, what kind of a body it is, what it does, what it doesn't do, and how it's vulnerable and open to its environment. And I think this is a, another valuable call of reminder for ourselves, this sort of openness and vulnerability. And so that's how I try to make sense of these things through the concept of affective entanglements in which we are tied to our environments closer than just an interaction that we could break out of and that we could say, oh, this is, you know, it, it's, it's been nice having some emotions in the natural world, you know, in the forest. Now let's go back to the city and uh, get rid of that. We can't separate dialectically the one from the other. This is why scholars such as Donna Haraway have coined uh, concepts such as nature cultures to point to the constitutive uh, uh, entanglement between these domains that sort of uh, European or colonial science has designated as, as uh, apart from one another, designations that don't make sense when we study action histories on the ground, least of all in South Asia. Next slide, please. This is everything that I said. Next slide. <laughs> now, um, of course, my project doesn't end there, uh, so the topics that I was currently in the State Archive for um, are actually uh, the topic of famine, the great 1896-97 uh, famine in India, in which uh, the Mahabodhi Society first instituted a relief committee, collected donations in order to uh, distribute relief, and uh, they kept this up through successive later environmental disasters, and I'm looking at the way um, how this was framed as a religious practice, and how uh, that kind of relief practice actually reached people or didn't. But it also includes, next, archaeological environments, I've pointed to this, and relics, which are also, uh, you know, which also merit an ecological perspective, I would say, even though they're not green, but rather gray. Um, it also includes, next, the constitution of landscapes, holy lands, India as the holy land of Buddhism, of course, has been worked on a lot, but also the curious fascination of these guys with the Himalayas, for example. You know, um, having the 13th Dalai Lama as president of the Mahabodhi Society without ever asking him, for example. Um, and it includes other topics, some of which the Mahabodhi Society also received from uh, earlier organizations such as the Theosophical Society, including animal liberation, vegetarianism, health concerns, etc., all of which are part of the way that in this particular moment in time, when the colonial state and its monopoly on uh, the scientific practice, now I've lost my friend, um, how in this intellectual frame, other vernacular epistemologies were also brought to the fore, and we can see the resurgence of certain vernacular concepts. Now, in conclusion, I think the last slide is my title. Yeah. Um, what I hope to have been talking about <laughs> today is how we can take an ecological perspective beyond just meaning green stuff, and beyond the dialectic of nature and culture. I don't want to argue that Buddhists were posthumanists avant la lettre, you know. I don't want to uh, posit this kind of uh, narrative of the holy origins of how, you know, if it wasn't written in the Vedas, then it was written in the Tipitaka. No. But there is a surprising resonance between certain concepts that we use uh, today, such as um, environmentality, ecology, um, new materialism, etc. 
and concepts that we find in the Pali Canon. Therefore, what I'm trying to do is use Buddhism as a conceptual resource for critical thinking and to balance out, as I said, the Eurocentrism that is inbuilt into a lot of contemporary Anthropocene scholarship and environmental humanities. And I think in the end, we may come out with something like Arturo Escobar's proposal of the pluriverse, of a world where many worlds fit, meaning that we don't have to reduce either the colonial period or ancient Theravada Buddhism or any other matter for that fact to an absolute. So of course, as I said, my actors were drawing on all kinds of different influences, right? Anagarika Dhammapala went to Christian schools. He was uh, well versed in the Bible and his anti-Christian uh, polemics that he repeatedly published in the Mahabodhi Journal are testament to this intimate knowledge of Christianity. And so of course, he went through the curriculum of the colonial state at that time and we can see the influences of this in the reporting that's going on in the Mahabodhi Journal. But we also see this whole host of other concepts and other thoughts being brought in. And that I believe, as a scholar, there is an acute need for us to find a way of including this in our research. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, I think this speech itself was quite uh, um, clear in that way, so I don't have to sum it up. Uh, and uh, that's the great part of it. But uh, it's customary to raise certain points so that it becomes easier for the audience to, um, to offer some questions that makes it more productive this kind of, uh, you know, mm, academic event to take it forward to the discussion. Now, what I could make out from it is that, um, you know, there it, you, you refer to the OE interest uh, text in the beginning, and um, you extensively talked about the OE interest scholarship uh, that uh, led to the uh, resurfacing of the book based reformers' engagement with those OE interest texts. Now, in today's context, if I'm not mistaken, and I guess all of you will agree, that there is another renewed attempt of Orientalism when people talk about dharma ecology, or people turning to all this text as esoteric solution to the ecological problem that we have. But what you try to do, and what your project is trying to do, is going into the genealogies of all these uh, efforts by the Buddhist reformers as I could make out, and also going into the micrological uh, details, uh, the empirical and the ethnographic uh, details of the making of these reformist movements that helped in the um, larger engagement of the Buddhist, uh, canonical as well as non-canonical text that you referred to. Now, uh, what strikes me as very interesting is your uh, <clears throat> emphasis on that image of the tree, where the tree uh, is prioritized against the temple, which is very interesting, um, given the fact that uh, in India we have uh, the primus in the other way around. Uh, and uh, you, you also uh, looked into uh, the details of the bodily uh, you know, engagement with the environment. And as uh, we mentioned at the very beginning about the convivialist manifesto. You, you kept on uh, referring about the entanglement issue that we have forgotten. So I think uh, the, the audience would have questions. Definitely I do have one or two questions which I would uh, take the privilege to place it before you before it is opened up for the audience. One is that you refer to the illusion pathway at the very beginning and uh, since we talked about assemblage quite a lot uh, referring to the tree, I'd be interested to know more a little bit about how do you 
engage with beauty and workery in the context of Buddhist scholarship and emotion. It's very interesting because they are famous for the theory of assembler, and they also wrote about what the art thing it really is. So I find it quite interesting this dialogue between the Oriental and the Occidental in a truly critical uh, space. The other one is um, you premised your research primarily on the Mahabharata society, which is understandable and quite interesting. But I'd be interested to know more about other Buddhist associations and organizations who also did something uh, similar. That would be interesting uh, from the perspective of future research. And uh, last but not the least, you referred to animal liberation. I'm interested in uh, this question of decolonizing animal studies, because when you talk about post-humanities, uh, critical animal studies is another emerging field. So uh, if you can throw a little bit uh, on critical animal studies from the perspective of Buddhist philosophy, that would be amazing. But these are my questions. Now I request the audience to, yeah, to have their questions that uh, Frederick can list them one by one and then you can go accordingly. Sure. Okay. Uh, if you can take one or two questions and then you can answer them. All right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Frederick. I'm Hi. Shumit. It was a fascinating talk. I'm really? not saying this to be nice. It's really <laughs> so I'm just uh, thinking aloud here, and I. Uh, it was a very complex talk, and we, I need to think about this a little bit more. But uh, in thinking aloud, I was trying to understand how you talk about the idea of the epistemological in terms of the way the Mahabharata society was trying to create an alternative space for uh, articulating the kind of nature-culture divide, or however you put it. You see, because, the, it, it, sorry, I mean, I'll, I'll be a bit long-winded here. Uh, the Mahabharata Society uh, was established in 1891, right? Uh, and and the, the Mahabharata Society Journal came out about the same time, right? Yeah. So this was a complex historical space we were talking about, right? The colonized space. And in the year 1843, the Tatsubudini Shoma was established, and the Tatsubudini Potrika started mm -hmm. to publish the organ of the Brahma Shaman. So. What it tried to do was, in the same kind of vein, a kind of a parallel vein, uh, it was trying to talk about, for example, the relationship between Brahma and the environment. So the universe constituted the environment for one of its very uh, primary uh, practitioners, whose name is Akhoi Kumar Dotto, who was a direct kind of a, kind of a descendant of uh, Ramon Roy, he was taking that, and the Rindra Nath, he was taking that forward, right? So what, what strikes me is that when he's arguing about uh, the kind of ways in which we see the world, we perceive the world, he's talking about not only how the human perceives the world with buddhi and vichara. I, I, I'm sure you understand these words, right? Yes, yeah, so buddhi and vichara. But he also, he brings in a typical local, or we, may, we, we might say vernacular way of looking at it, and he uses the word karuna shabha, which comes from the word karuna, so compassion, right? And he talks about how we, we, we need to perceive, perceive the world, God, our relationship with the environment in terms of oihik paratrik mongol, that is, uh, 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 Mongol, which is uh, good for this world and the next. Mm. You talk about Rajendra Ralmitra. Mm. He was part of the same milieu, so he knew all these people and he was also kind of very much involved with the Mahamati society. Now, my question would be this that, you know, these people, the Tattu Bodhini Shabha and the people around it, uh, Brian Hatcher calls them eclectic this eclectic milieu, uh, they were trying to, in a certain sense, push towards an alternative epistemology uh, in terms of historical representation of the past. So would you say, would you suggest that the Mahavati society along with its, uh, uh, the, the, the many formulations uh, around the environment, it was trying to kind of posit a kind of alternative epistemology to the 
Western Eurocentric Hegelian one? So that is my question. Okay. Um, thank you. That was a great question. Um, maybe I'll just take it up uh, as the first one. Um, I think you're absolutely right in, uh, in pointing out the complexity of these networks and the complexity of, uh, you know, also Kolkata as, an, as a space of thought at that time, obviously, being so connected. Um, I see some important differences between uh, organizations such as the Brahma Samaj and the Mahabodhi Society. And that's one part of my answer. And the other part of my answer is that I have to limit myself somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so I'm doing this as, as a you know, scholar of Buddhism. So, uh, so these are sort of my main actors. And then I'm following them to are they interacting with other people. And it's interesting to see who are they interacting with and who are they perhaps not interacting with. But um, coming back to the first, first part of my answer, organizations such as the Brahma Samaj were definitely on a mission to, to reconceive of the world in terms such as you, such as you described. With the Mahabodhi Society, I'd be more careful um, with that statement. When I speak of their their um, sort of epistemology or space of thought. I mean, what are the intellectual influences that they draw on? And they come from various directions. They come, as I discussed, from the Palikal, but they also come from contemporary science. Uh, they come from politics. Uh, you know, later Dhammapada went, you know, for a while he was very political, etc., etc. Keeps talking about colonialism. Um, and so for me, one of the things why this, uh, this research project is particularly interesting is because it's not just out there. So this green language that I'm talking about and these, um, these, these, the way that the non-human keeps creeping in to the pages of the Mahabodhi Journal, to the speeches of their members, etc., they are very often, quite literally, as the illustrations that I showed you, on the margins and between the lines. And so I would not want to go as far as to say that they were conceiving of their main mission as, you know, uh, fundamentally decentering the colonial uh, view of the world. They didn't feel that Buddhism um, needed to be, um, needed to prove itself as a different view of the world. They, this was taken for granted. The reinvigoration of Buddhism in India was their project. And so you have all these narratives of Buddhism having gone extinct. You have all of these narratives that they inherit from the theosophists and others of masculine invasions, etc., etc. We now know, of course, that this is not true, or at least not as extreme as you know the narrative uh, suggests. Um, and so, and so, you see what I mean. There is a there is a difference. They are not saying that um, we need to radically reconceive our view of the world. We they are saying we need to radically reconceive of the position of Buddhism in India, and then that sort of snowballs that results in a kind in all kinds of conceptual operations that they do. I think sometimes without um, consciously uh, being aware of it. And so I'm interested in how is this creeping in? You know, because they are so logocentric. They are all about the, the human and their mind and training the mind and meditative practice, etc. In a very sort of, I mean, you know, Henry Steele Olcott coined this term Protestant Buddhism and then the Mahabodhi Society kind of drifted away from that. But this was a strong influence of this kind of new sense of purity of going back to the doctrine, etc., etc. And so, and so I'm more interested in this sort of itch that you can't really scratch when you look at these sources. Now, as for Anindya, your 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 questions, 
there, there are a lot. <laughs> um, how do I draw on Deleuze and Guattari and, uh, and the assemblage? And do I want to say a lot more about this? Well, <laughs> I mean, reading Deleuze and Guattari always means shedding tears, uh, not necessarily out of joy. It's a bit like reading Derrida. <laughs> um, and luckily for me, they are not uh, sort of the only game in town and not the last word. And uh, for example, scholars that inspire me a lot on the concept of the assemblage are people such as Karl Barad or Jane Bennett, who have used the assemblage in a way that is, uh, that is somewhat different from Deleuze and Guattari. Because if you look at Deleuze and Guattari's project, they conceive of this project as fundamentally rooted in psychology. Uh, it's this whole thing of the schizoanalytic project. And so their sense of the assemblage um, needs a certain, requires a certain sense of desire in a psychological sense. And then you have you know, the body without organs and the thinking machines and all of this kind of stuff, which is a lot of theoretical jargon that is hard to historicize or is hard to apply to historical scholarship. For me, the assemblage makes sense because it's a phenomenon that I can observe on my own and because it's an, it's an analytical concept that resonates very well with Buddhist thought in the sense that I mentioned that the individual is also constituted as an assemblage, etc. Et so, so this is the way that I draw on the assemblage, less so in a kind of direct line of saying I'm continuing the Lisbon Guattari's project because then this would have a lot of further consequences down the line for my practice of the history of emotions, etc., etc. If I'm following, you know, a very Freudian kind of uh, psychological approach that they are using. Um, other Buddhist organizations, organizations that did similar things to the Mahabodhi Society, yes. And uh, at this point in time that I'm looking at, uh, they are cropping up, right? The Bengal Buddhist Association is uh, cropping up. Others, a bit later, the first wave of Dalit Buddhists are also, uh, you know, making themselves heard way before, decades before the Ambedkarites. Um, again, I have to be selective because in the end, this has to be a feasible project. <laughs> Um, and so the answer is a bit similar, that I'm looking at uh, who is important to these guys and who are they talking to, and, um, and that kind of makes some of my decisions, because otherwise I will never stop. Um, animal liberation, liberation and the decolonization of animal studies. Yes, animal studies is firmly in need of decolonization, and there's still a lot of this overhang of anthropomorphism and moralization and animal rights is a fundamentally fraught term. But when I historicize these debates, I say less about animal studies in the present than about the way that they frame it then, which is, as I briefly mentioned, is they get a lot of these topics, which are hot topics at that time. They get a lot of these topics from other organizations, such as the Theosophists, who are publishing, you know, I mean, almost every issue of their periodicals, they are publishing these uh, uh, articles on anti vivisection movement, sometimes with gross illustrations of uh, tortured animals for medical research, etc., on the benefits of vegetarianism, the purported ancient history of vegetarianism, all of this kind of stuff. So they are getting this somewhere, and they already get it from an orientalist voice. So, um, let alone you know, decolonizing animal studies now, I'm dealing with a fundamentally colonial kind of animal studies at that time. And so I have to uh, first have to work with that. And so that's, of course, where the difference between <clears throat> the difference between the concepts of my actors and my analytical concepts uh, drifts apart, which is also a chance because it allows me to, uh, to look at these phenomena with a different perspective than we have today, just you know, same way as we would, I don't know, use a gender as a lens into whatever history, even if it wasn't an actor's concept back then, we can still use this as an analytical concept. So in that sense, I'm trying to keep these strands separate. Um, 
Yeah, I think I'll stop there now, and I'm hoping for more questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Frederick, uh, for an extremely um, interesting, but also, uh, as Shumi points out, it gives a lot to think about uh, for us. Um, I think uh, more than a question, this is something, it's very interesting, uh, and I think a lot of the people in the audience would agree, um, though you're talking about uh, Buddhism and Mahabharati society, but this relation between the tree and spiritualism, which we in Hinduism, and I'm talking about religion here, not exactly only spiritualism, uh, but uh, you know, in the Hindu religion, there's this constant uh, repetition of people uh, in search of um, spiritual, you know, whatever you want to call it, the um, nirvana or whatever, they're moving out of society, but there is a tree somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. And even in certain um, belief systems in Hinduism, the tree itself is worshipped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a temple, there's a tree outside, yeah. and then people are tying strings and, you know, they, they, they regard it as a belief system, but the tree itself is being worshipped. So there's this very interesting connection. I mean, all that I want to say is your talk is just, you know, bringing these ideas into your head. Um, because I haven't thought about it and I do not know about the historical um, dates and which, uh, which goes before what. But uh, this is very interesting that in Hinduism it does exist, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, you bring it to mind the fact that, you, you know, um, I suppose you know by now that Durga Puja is a major festival for Kolkata. But if you remember, for the Bengalis, before you start the puja, we have to take the banana plant. Ah. And so there is a very intrinsic kind of relationship between trees and gods and worship of gods and spiritualism at another level. <coughs> Uh, the other thing that comes to mind is this fact that for a lot of the spiritual spears, seekers from Bengal that we know of had to move out of society and um, this is another interesting aspect. Uh, it might sound naive and stupid but uh, the, the burning hearts where we usually cremate bodies, uh, spiritual spe seekers go there. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? So it's away from society. So it's not only, I don't know where emotion comes in here, I'm trying to think about that, but it's away from society. It's not only the tree, but it's not any tree within the locality. You just sit there and you get it. It's away from the crowd. It's away from uh, human, um, you know, local, mm. where people are reciting. It, it will have to be. So Bamakhapa, you know, one of the spiritual seekers that we know of, of course, that's another tradition, tantric tradition and all of that. But he goes to the um, samsan that we call it, the uh, place where we, beside the river where we cremate bodies. So that's again, mm. you know, another place, space in nature, which is not exactly the place where people reside. Right? So thank you. Just thoughts coming after your lecture. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Like a banyan tree. Let's <laughs> 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 Sure. Yeah. Let's take another Thank you for your fascinating talk. Uh, this is not a question actually. I want to, I'm trying to think uh, with you. Uh, what you are trying to teach, I think, is the importance of faith systems or the values that are associated with faith, religion, uh, because uh, you know what you are talking in with reference to Buddhism, and Madam just has talked about with reference to Hinduism. I think it is common to every faith, okay? Because if you, if you, if you talk about Islam, their prophet Muhammad goes goes to Mount Hera, and then he, there he takes uh, uh, there he has the first revelation of the Quran. 
Okay, and then in Islam, you know, the world is thought of as a mosque, and we are its vice regent. Okay, and then if you talk about the you know, process of evolution, where you need the water, the water purifies you before you go for a submission to the God. So you know the elements, you know that that is purifying you, uh, and in a way, you know, it re, you know, you know, you know uh, uh, re-energizing. If not re-energizing, you know, you know think, uh, you know, leading us towards a new conception of the of our ontological self, you know. So, faith systems and their imports, I think you are, that's what you are talking about. And in this time of Anthropocene that we are all concerned with, I think, uh, you know, you, you are talk, trying to talk about the importance of these, you know, thought systems. So, I, I try to think with you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, we can have our last person. Is there anyone? Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. I love to repeat that. Uh, not that I have understood everything, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but and the glimpses that I could uh, take, uh, it was just an experience. Uh, it, it, it's a question, rather, it is not straight out of your talk, but rather it, I try to connect with your talk. Mm. It's about Jatakas. Uh, when you were, you were talking about effective entanglement and uh, individual with his or her environment around environing him or her, uh, when uh, a kind of interface you were, talking, you were actually hinting at. Yeah. Internal, external, etc., etc., and all these things. As if uh, kind of diversifying the mode that individual is. Exactly. But the point is, it's all about space. Mm. What about Jataka? Mm -hmm. A kind of demand in by several bodhisattvas coming to Buddha. Yeah. Now, is it a kind of a dialogue with past? It's an entanglement with, with, with time. And again, an interface. The Buddha, mm. great Buddha, mm. who comes through the ages. And it's it actually it kind of, uh, uh, maybe it, uh, it's, a, it, it's a prejudice sort of mind that uh, uh, some sort of uh, that, that kind of uh, or, uh, all, all these things uh, um, they kind of confuse us somewhat mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm again saying that it is a prejudiced uh, conviction but we actually have this confusion coming from a kind of a modernist way of thinking I'm not going to that but still if we can make a philosophical journey through the Jataka stories, hmm. instead of taking a kind of a uh, scientific kind of analytical analysis, then maybe Jataka, through the, uh, what should I say, through the prism that we have given us today, the entanglement, yeah. which you are actually focusing on space, or space, can you uh, somehow shed some light on? Time, time through Jataka. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Your take, fantastic. Uh, thanks, especially for bringing up time. This is uh, one of my pet peeves, particular interests. Um, you know, I've, I've, in my previous research, I worked a lot on on uh, what I term transtemporal relations, on how any kinds of relations between two spaces are usually also relations between times. And, uh, and you know, the way that communities form or emplace themselves always implies a certain um, emplacement in time, in temporal relations as well. And we see a lot of this going on, you know, with the different temporal moments also that I opened up in my talk, right? We are in the late 19th century, we are 
two and a half uh, millennia before that, in the time of the Buddha, we are also today, you know, using the concerns of today to have a different perspective on history, etc. So definitely that's happening. But actually also, um, you bringing up the Jatakas allows me to combine two questions, namely the first question, the very great uh, response that you had on the, on the fundamental importance of trees in South Asia. Um, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, ink has also been spilled on this uh, topic already, on uh, especially uh, human tree relations in, in different, you know, denominations that we group under Hinduism. Um, but I find it really interesting, again, how you make that distinction of a sort of how we happen upon the tree, right? We're trying to sort of get away from somewhere and we end up underneath a tree. And I think it's, uh, there is that sort of, um, there is that sort of surprising quality. Of course, the tree is also very quotidian, especially the, the Hindu religious tree is so quotidian. All across the city are dotted little shrines. There is a little Shiva Lingam and, you know, there is a tree. And of course, you know, as you said, it depends on the kind of tree or the different species. But there are also, um, there are also, of course, differences in how the trees are conceived of. And, um, and and in Hinduism more than in Buddhism, but not exclusively, um, the tree is a residence for a deity. And so you worship the tree because it's the seat of a deity. Uh, or, and or, because it's also, say, part of the deity's body in its cosmological creation, in the way, you know, that the four different types of fig were kind of created, etc., etc. We have all these myths that talk about it. And in Buddhism, the question becomes tricky, and you have to be very specific of what kinds of, what kind of Buddhism you are talking about, in the sense of, are you talking about uh, the Theravada that we see in the Pali text? Are, are we talking about different shades of Theravada? Are we talking about Mahayana and where, etc., etc.? Because there is a lot of stuff going on with trees, but we have to be specific uh, on who is doing it. <coughs> and in the, you know, regarding the question of early Buddhism, mm, a lot of really interesting research has been done by uh, textual scholars such as Lambrecht Schmidhausen in Hamburg, for example, who has worked extensively on the uh, uh, on trees and plants as what he termed borderline beings in early Buddhism. And his argument basically runs like this: um, for Buddhists, for early Buddhists, trees were not sentient beings because they don't um, conform to the to the criteria that you need. To have a sentient being, and they are at maximum ek imbriya. They have a sense of touch. That's it. Um, now, of course, today we know that uh, plants have all kinds of senses, and so we have to revise the ek imbriya theory there. Um, but Schmidhausen and others have argued that there is a sort of we can see in the earliest strata of the Pali text a kind of overhang, where probably. Um, Early Buddhism was, was acknowledging that there are other spiritual traditions in the places that it existed in that worshipped uh, certain kinds of trees and plants as sentient beings. And hence, they, they kept it ambiguous in order to sort of, this was a strategic operation, that's the gist of what these scholars are saying, in the sense of leaving it open, it's, you know, not a Buddhist teaching per se, but Buddhism sort of affords some room to kind of, you know, include these people and their beliefs. And um, and so this brings me back to the to the interesting uh, resource that the Jatakas are, which are of course, I mean, in terms of the cultural history and the social history of early Buddhism, of course, the Jatakas are brimming with with so much, and I mean, in themselves, in terms of the way that they are structured for those, I guess everyone knows, but the Jatakas are, of course, the tales of the Buddha's previous incarnations before he became a Buddha. And he, um, and so they have also these inbuilt, really interesting temporal loops in which the Jataka is always a moral tale that tells a moral story. So it's almost like a kind of a fable where very often uh, animals uh, speak, uh, other beings, we have heavenly beings, etc., etc. 
Um, and then there is always another part of the Jataka, which is in a different time, which is in the historical present of the Buddha, which is something happens, someone does something, and in order to teach that person the right way how to go about doing whatever you're doing, the Buddha recounts the tale. And so we have this recursive temporality, this kind of loop between the present in which you're reading it, the present of the Buddha, and the kind of uh, you know, present before in an earlier incarnation of the Buddha. And um, in, I forget the number, I counted them, but then you know, my brain, <laughs> I think it might be 24 instances, or I don't, don't quote me on it, something like that. Um, the Buddha himself is a Rukka Devta, a tree deity in his previous incarnation. Viksha Deva, Rukka Devta in Nepali. And so, um, so then we have a Jataka such as the Badrasala Jataka, the tree of the, Badra, the Badra, no, the, the good uh, Sal tree, the Shorya Robusta tree, which is very common, um, which, in which the Buddha is a tree spirit that lives in an ancient Shal tree. And uh, there is a king who wants to fell this shard tree in order to build this gigantomaniac project. Um, and then the, 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 the tree deity, the Buddha, and the king, they have a conversation in verse, and, um, and the deity con uh, kind of, uh, in the end, the, the king doesn't fell the tree. Not because he has pity for the tree itself, but because the tree um, is kind of telling him all the, the, the ways, the specific ways in which he wants to be cut so as not to hurt his offspring when he falls. Because when a big tree falls, it smashes a lot of small trees. And so out of compassion, Karna, with the small trees, um, he's saying, okay, but then you have to cut me branch by branch, etc., you know, so that nothing falls to the side uh, to take care, you know, of my family. And in the end, nobody's cut. And I, I find this super interesting because, of course, I'm working on trees, so, you know, it's very simple. But there is also fear comes up several times in this Jataka, the fear of the king when he sees the Luka um, and the fear for the family of this tree, etc. And, and it basically what it says is um, the king learns to emphasize, uh, empathize, to put himself in the role of another, and this other being a tree, which is surprising because it's not a sentient being, but through the agency of being animated by a Luka Devta, it is. And so this is what I mean by the assemblage, that um, you know, the tree in itself, sort of if you if you if we had a time machine and we transported, say, Buddha Rosha, you know, or some of the big scholars of, of you know uh, Pali literature. And we ask them, okay, yes or no, are trees living beings? They would say no. But then, you know, when there is the data in the tree, then the tree, and there is this interesting metonymic slide in this Jataka where the tree deity speaks of the tree as my own sharira, my own flesh, you know, sharira, the body in the, in the most physical kind of sense, no? sharira, like the, that's corpse, basically. So um, so there is this overlap. So somehow he just lives in the tree, but also the tree is his body. And so that's how, you know, inside already the tree we see several aspects happening, and we see an assemblage, and then the king learns to relate emotionally to this assemblage, and gets, of course, on the right path, which is, which is uh, compassion, and feels the compassion that the tree itself exemplifies towards its uh, towards its family. Oh, this was a very long circuitous answer that has perhaps answered some of your questions and probably not. <laughs> and um, for for the middle question on on thinking with and um, and uh, you know Islamic cosmologies def definitely. Um, the question is what are we positing? this against? Are we saying faith systems are uh, sort of repositories of knowledge or systems of or knowledge systems, which they surely are. They are cultural systems of encoding knowledges and priorities and narratives, concepts, tropes, etc. Um, and then what's the opposite? Is the opposite only uh, 
bad Eurocentric science or um, because there is more also going on in the present, right? So we have, for example, in the Latin American tradition, we would have uh, a political ontology, uh, which is, you know, a, a decolonial practice um, uh, championed by people like Maturana and Varela and um, Escobar, etc. Um, and, and what do we do with that? But still, as a historian and a historian of South Asia, I feel like, hmm, okay, is it better to just come with all of this Latin American stuff? You know, is the sort of escape from Eurocentrism that? Which is great. I mean, I love the stuff that they write and uh, thinking, yeah, and I mentioned the Peruvians and all of that, but yes, I think that we have to do more bridging. And so going to uh, faith systems, which are basically just knowledge systems in a sense. I mean, of course, they are more. They also contain practices and institutions and uh, spaces and uh, trans-temporal relations, etc., etc. But if we look at them as resources for thinking, <coughs> then they are knowledge systems. And um, we can draw on that, perhaps, in a sense, sacrilegiously. I'm very aware of that. You know, I'm not standing here uh, as a monk. Um, and I don't uh, say these things in terms of advocating doctrinal purity. I say these things in the spirit of people such as Nikita Dawan and Gayati Chakravarti Spivak, and the concept of ab hyphen use, or the concept of affirmative sabotage. So we are stuck with English, in a sense, aren't we? Because we want to have you know, communication, and um, anyway, we have to agree on one language. And even if it were Bangla, then Bangla has its own inbuilt assumptions, which are not, you know, necessarily Eurocentric, but, you know, I mean, we've all made endless jokes about provincializing Europe and globalizing Bengal. So, you know, if we globalize Bengal, then we are in a different hegemonic thought space. And so what do we do if, there, if there's no getting out of a hegemonic thought space, be it uh, you know, Bangla thought space, Eurocentric thought space in English, in French, in German, Latin American, whatever. I think that the concepts that we use in terms of our analytical categories, not the concepts of our actors, they are our actors' concepts. And they are historical, so there's no change in them. But our analytical categories, I think, have a certain elasticity, right? We can kind of pull them open and try to push something inside. <laughs> And if I draw inspiration and say that, no, actually the way that the individual is constituted in Buddhism is fundamentally different than, you know, the person is an assemblage, which is open and vulnerable towards the environment, etc. This is, of course, like the fever nightmare of, uh, you know, Descartes and thinkers like that. And so this is my act of affirmative sabotage, that when I'm using certain categories, I'm trying to uh, change their semantics, not in the sense of, now everything's going to be fine, wonderful, I've solved the world's problems, blah, you know, at the end of the day, I'm also just another white dude talking, you know, so, um, but, <laughs> but I think step by step, we can try, and so um, I'm just aspiring to be a saboteur. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Uh, I don't know if my question is relevant to today's talk or not, but... That you will never stop you from asking. <laughs> uh, you just raised my uh, expectation. So I have few queries about something. Um, Nichiren Buddhism, I don't know, I am... Nichiren Buddhism. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, the Japanese, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, which is uh, associated with Kamakura School mm. of Buddhism. Uh, who mainly talked about meditation. Um, most of the Buddhist monks talked about the meditation which is practiced by close eyes. <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, close eyes and uh, need to concentrate on breathing, mm. uh, like that. But Nichiren Buddhism talked about uh, that we need to practice our meditation with open eyes so that we can connect with our surroundings, our environment, and where we are, we need to consciously uh, stay there. Mm -hmm. And then we can uh, concentrate on our physical things like mm -hmm. that. So uh, I would like to know about more uh, 
on Nigerian Buddhism if you enlighten few words in few words or uh, how I know more <coughs> uh, you can just I'm really not the expert on Nigerian Buddhism so oh, okay. I, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to you know uh, as we say leave myself out of the window uh, to talk about things that I'm not qualified to talk about uh, but but yeah, certainly, you know, in a very generalized sense, in, uh, in Zen Buddhist practice, you look at the white wall, you, I mean, most of the time the eyes are half closed, they're not fully closed, but um, there is a, it's a different, often it's a different kind of uh, spiritual practice, and Nichiren is positing uh, themselves against this. So that's a, an intervention that is specific to Japan because of the prehistory of first Chan Buddhism in, in China, you know, which basically is the Dhyana tradition, and then moves to Japan and becomes Zen Buddhism, which is just another reading for the same Chinese character. Um, but sort of coming back to the to <coughs> the stuff that I was talking about, I'm interested in, in interrogating this description of perception, which is also a description of the relation between the person and their environment. And so, if it's a description of a certain shutting off of the environment in the sense of you close your eyes or you turn to the white wall or whatever, or it's a description such as the Nietzschean or such as, you know, some of the passages that I uh, quoted to you are also, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on, right? And in the Satipatthana Sutta, in the later section, um, the monk is in the channel ground, in the burning ground, and observing, you know, the the sort of um, decomposition of the body in terms of, uh, you know, um, observe and observing um, um, and um, but all of these descriptions are descriptions of relations to environment. So. So coming back to that is it's a bit similar to saying, oh, these people were not very emotional, so it's not interesting from the perspective of the history of emotion. Whether or not someone has it, you know, is openly showing emotions is always interesting from that perspective, because if they're not, then that already says a lot. And so similar here, if there is a practice that stresses a kind of very controlled or limited engagement with an environment, that's also in a certain, you know, larger contextual frame of relating to environment. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, so today in the morning we were told uh, that Frederick is slightly under weather and he had sore throat and was not keeping well, but this poor long session of affirmative sabotage um, <laughs> comes to an end with the entangled crew or so you know, that system is really very really <laughs> very productive and really that's the energy that we really were charmed about that you uh, kept on answering all the questions to the last point so thank you so much for that and now after this comes the thanks giving session uh, it's a formal uh, way of thanksgiving and for that and after the thanksgiving we have a uh, for tea but i request uh, my colleague professor omita Modas of the school of language studies to uh, tell you for the four thanks okay. so uh, thank you very No, sir. Good afternoon. On behalf of Institute of Language Studies and Research, I am Sir Kolkata. I would like to extend our collective thanks to Dr. Frederick Sua of Max Planck Institute for his fascinating talk and we have as a nodal, uh, nodal center um, to far from the role of a hyphen and that's why I think uh, the emotion of the uh, researcher and this environment of this audience uh, 
I think it is already linked. Um, we also thank profusely uh, the government of West Bengal, headed by the Honorable Chief Minister of West Bengal, ILSA, an institute of academic research affiliated to Department of Higher Education, remains grateful to uh, government's support. Uh, without the support and inspiration of the government, we couldn't have arranged this invited talk. We thank the Honorable Minister in Charge, Department of Higher Education, who is also the chairman of ILISHA for making all high quality academic activities at ILISHA possible. Our heartfelt thanks to all the respected officials and staff of the Department of Higher Education, especially our secretary, Sri uh, Shivaji Ghosh, who is present here, and also our uh, thanks to Sri Sukanto Acharji, one of the dreamers of ILSR. All the officials, office staff, and colleagues at Heart Education Council provided tremendous support and consistent help to all of us, and we are grateful to all of them for this. Our security staff, housekeeping, driving, and technical support staff provide tremendous help for all through, and we express our heartful thanks to them. We also convey our gratefulness to Professor Shashwati Mutsuddi, Department of Pali, Calcutta University, for introducing us to Frederick and for a consistent support to ILSA. We also thank uh, the respected vice chairperson, vice chairperson of West Bengal State Council of Higher Education for her consistent support and academic guidance, as well as uh, we thank uh, the Joint Secretary, uh, Sri Devashis Dattu, uh, Joint Secretary uh, Finance, and also uh, extend our uh, thanks to uh, Joint Secretary Academic. Uh, all the stakeholders of the larger ILSR family are remembered with gratitude for their regular support and academic companionship. We also thank our academic collaborators, namely Bangla Academy, Urdu Academy, Shantari Academy of West Bengal. Our thanks to Shanskrito Shaito Parishad, Jadupur University, Shanskrito College and University, Shidhu Kano Birsha University, Shadhu Ramchand Murmu University of Jhargram, North Bengal University, Calcutta University, Frankfurt University, etc. for their academic collaboration. We are sure that this academic dialogue and journey will continue. Thank you, one and all, and we wish we will, uh, on the way, uh, we will uh, collaborate and we will, um, we will unite it. Uh, we will be united in our journey uh, to fulfill the dream of Ayurveda as a nodal center in, in the academic area of this state. Thank you. If I may keep you this long, give you a little bit longer. Um, I also want to offer my sincere gratitude for all of you coming here today. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's my personal pleasure that you all came, that you ask great questions. I feel spoiled. I feel spoiled by the kindness of the people that I've already mentioned and by countless others. I feel um, spoiled by the very warm human interactions that we've had, 
here in this building that we've had in other buildings across the city that we've had over coffee, uh, you know, having Adda in the coffee house. So when you come here, um, you know, 7,000 kilometers from Germany, and it's my first time in Kolkata, I didn't expect this kind of warmth um, to be received with literally open arms. And so it means the world to me. And this is, I think, why academia thrives when it does, because we come together as humans. So, um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming here. Thank you for extending the invitation to me. And um, I hope to be back, not to talk your ears off, but uh, to, you know, continue our fruitful conversation. Thank you. We have had a